Yeah. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to today's CIMPD seminar. So, my name is Ren Jun Duan from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So, it's really my great pleasure to introduce today's uh, uh, speaker, Irene Gamble. So, let me uh, say a few words. So, she's a professor of mathematics at the University of Texas, Austin, and the director of the Applied Mathematics Group at the Auden Institute. So she holds the WA Tax uh, Mooncliffe Junior Chair in Computational Engineering and Sciences 3. She earned her PhD at the University of Chicago in 1989. Uh, she has made substantial contributions to the different research area, including applied and computational analysis, mathematical statistical physics, nonlinear kinetic and the partial differential equations Boltzmann operators and the collisional theory. So far, she has more than 100 publications in peer-reviewed journals. She's well known for her research works on analytical and the computational issues in collisional kinetic theory. Among them, I would mention actually some distinguished works uh, on some properties of kinetic and hydrodynamic equations for inelastic interactions stationary transonic solutions of a one-dimensional hydrodynamic model for semiconductors and on the Boltzmann equation for diffusively excited granular media, uh, for, uh, for instance. So uh, those works actually make me know her since I was a PhD student. So she earned uh, many prestigious academic achievements, including 2012 Sun Fellow for contributions to analytical numerical method for statistical transport problems in complex particle systems. Uh, 2013 Fellow of AMS, and uh, she was one of the best scholars in mathematics by research.com. So today she's going to talk about uh, weak turbulence modeled by cosinlinear diffusion for electrostatic and uh, magnetize the plasma systems. So Erin, please. Thank you very much for this uh, kind, uh, very kind intro introduction. So, so um, I'm delighted to be uh, asked to, to do this uh, presentation and I'm very uh, grateful. I hope I do a good job. <laughs> so, uh, so this scenario that I've started to work about Three years ago, um, it was uh, yeah, three years, three, three, four years ago, um, perhaps a little bit on the onset of the pandemic, and uh, and it's mainly uh, working in in uh, collaboration with uh, one of my graduate students about to graduate, um, is Ku uh, Huang, uh, originally from China, and has been in, uh, at the Auden Institute. He's on his fifth year and, and graduating this by the end of this year. So we started with a project that was generated by the um, uh, a, um, a proposal that I did with some group on physics in the future in the Institute of Fusion Studies, and it was related to runaway uh, avoidance and generation and and, uh, and mitigation in tokamaks um, for magnetized ones. That, that was, you know, uh, for those that know me, I work a lot on, on Boltzmann Poisson, but I've never done anything really on a tokamak, much less with a highly magnetized effect. So so that was an, a little bit of upscale, but it, 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 it landed us in a very unique uh, spot where there is very little mathematics that has been done. And perhaps what I can say and what you are going to see is a rather modest distribution modest contribu contribution that it may it may really give place to much more developments from the mathematics point of view and so today i will explain the model i will show you how we did some simulations because that was the motivator the, the motivation the grant was about doing simulations and we did that and they were so spectacularly stable and good at getting things that i told uh, kuhn we should have a, a theorem behind this. I mean, something has to be happening. You you don't you don't compute things that come up immediately the way you want them to be, or you expect them to be, or what we was predicted in Russia in the sixties what they sh the behavior should be. So 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 this is what the lecture is about. So I'm going to explain you the model as it is um, in the highly magnetized framework. Although the analysis 
is going to be done in the one dimensional framework. And as actually the same model that Bardos and Bess have been actually working on trying to show this derivation of weak turbulence uh, kind of configuration uh, for, for electrostatics, which are usually modeled in 1D. So, so uh, the, the mathematics is not on the, on the highly magnetized uh, plasma, but eventually it may be extended. I believe it, it should be there somehow. Um, of course, as all of the things, they have a lot of caveats and what is this weak turbulence model? I like to, to say it in something that is nowadays people like to talk about at least at Oren Institute, and it's, it's a model reduction of um, uh, essentially of a problem that was displaced on, um, on the blast of Maxwell system on which you assume you have an initial data, which is a, is a, is a so I'm, I'm, I'm pointing up to you on this diagram. This is a schematic comes from the book of Thorne, which explained the model beautifully and I recommend it. Uh, it, it actually um, it came, it's not Rostokov, sorry, it's Rudakov and Ivanov and 67 actually make, promote, uh, propose it. And in the 1D case, even they proposed the type of so similar kind of uh, uh, manipulation on which it lends us into the model we can we can set something from the mathematics point of view, but it all starts with Landau and Balescu in the third, third in the sixties, um, Venedov and Velikov and Sagir in the in Sagdiv in the sixties and Kennel in sixty five, and Ivanov and Rostokov they do it for tokamaks. In fact. Cannot do, do it for um, astrodynamics uh, or, or you know uh, astrophysics and um, and um, and many many um, and and you know uh, what comes from Landau and Balescu and so on is really again model reductions and try to see ha what happens as you have a small perturbation a small perturbation of the tail on what happens in this in this um, motion by Blast of Maxwell. And what is really interesting, and you see it in the, in the simulations, for me it was many of the things very new. Even if you start with a completely zero magnetic and force field, the coupling of the Maxwell's equations that know about the particle distribution, and then it's a true mean field theory calculation, then it arises into a, a, a perturbed model, which under the assumption of ergodic theorems, because you have a, in, think of the tokamak, or think of the some confinement that your magnetized um, plasma may have because of external uh, configuration. Uh, if then you would end up having a sort of the ergodic theorems that if you wait long in time and your and your plasma visit it right or the particles visit the boundary in a way that after a long time they are dense this visit then you can set that the, the model can be, um, it becomes average in a space, not necessarily in velocity space. And here is key, this understanding, that you start with a blast of equation, which is a probability distribution function model for uh, a particle distribution in a position of space, time t, and momenta. And what the ergodic theory says and tells you, okay, be in a confined domain, it could be a specular reflection, diffusive reflection type of things, for example, and then wait long enough and the flow averages in space. But still you get the effects on the tail that are modeled by the Maxwell's equation. How that is possible if you are in a space is that the Ma Maxwell's equations, and this is the richness of this, um, of this um, uh, theory, that these people in the 60s draw from all the developments in the 40s and 50s on Feynman, Green and Dyson, uh, Byam and Kainal's formalisms that basically says, look at the spectral form of the, um, or the Wigner form, if you wish, right? Which is put a spectral that makes the quantum uh, or quasi-linear particles that we may think of electrons Evolve according to mean field forces of, uh, you know, of uh, Lorentzian type of force into a system that even if you average in a space, the effect of the Maxwell's equations will remain 
in a spectral density form. And I explain that in a minute. So, so this is, a, as I said, a reduced problem. And basically what I'm going to show you is um, the simulation that we did for the strongly magnetized case after I, I do the problem disappear in Journal of Computational Physics in past June. And this is also with Kung Wang, Michael Abdelmalik, and Boris Preisman, who's a physicist at the Institute for um, uh, Fusion Studies at UT Austin. And, um, and then with, uh, with um, with um, uh, Kuhn one, we actually do the mathematics of what Bardos and Bess initiated trying to get a rigorous derivation of this model that was proposed by Ivanov and Rudakov. I have to change that name, it is changed later. Okay, so uh, the framework has to be very, uh, or at least the way I bring it to your attention is a way to say uh, that, um, uh, what is the, the the coordinate frame if you want to work with mean field theory on you are doing a probability distribution function in momentum space and time and i will show you later how you do the model reduction and and why it's weak turbulence and and the plasmon uh which is also we call the the we call it Z, which is the spectral um uh energy density associated to the magnetic equations. And in fact, it's very interesting because this W here I'm missing, uh, it's a poly, well, it's a function of the energy of K because it's actually the, the Fourier transform of the of the electric field square multiplied by uh, K cross K that comes from the Maxwell uh, form. So, so the framework is, take the framework of the tokamak, the, the fact that you are going to be doing the toroidal and cylindrical coordinates related to guiding uh, uh, coordinate centers that the, the physicists like to use. And, um, and so we essentially are going to be splitting the momentum space in these 3D cylindrical coordinates, where R is a constant ratio, for for the uh, for for the frame that you may be actually doing in the tokamak. In general, you can actually take much more generic rates. Uh, that basically selects exactly the same way of how we uh, refer to to the um, um, to the uh, kinetic uh, uh, to the sorry the spectral energy density coordinates, and it's going to be the splitting on the parallel component to, to beta, alpha is the azimuthal angle, and k would be the cylindric, so k and k star is the cylindrical coordinates associated to the, to the motion. So, so I remind you that this is the full system in classical space, where the Maxwell's equations are written in, in physical space, and the Blasov comes up to this, to came to this, and the way the, the model is derived, and for that, I, I recommend you to, so to go to the Thorn. Um, there is a very thick book that it was edited in 17, and it's actually, you, you can get it, and, but it's like 2,000 pages or more, but, 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 but it's also edited in, in seven or six, five shorter uh, paperback versions. Uh, also a big one is in paperback that is not very expensive. And I and I think for me, it has been a wide opening. It's a, it's a physics that mathematicians can, can read very well. And, um, and, so, and so, um, so what happened is the following, you, you have this model and, and then you start with a, with a, with a uh, initial data that is going to be um, a, a Maxwell distribution plus, plus, something that is going to be uh, a perturbation after you actually do the average in, in, in a space, because you are going to assume that the perturbation left after that average is going to be very small, or the piece that we are going to be neglecting, this has to be a very small amplitude that still remains in a space. So the idea, so this is the first model reduction. The ergodic theorems and the random phase approximation essentially says this becomes a dominant term and this is very small order. The delta F where you keep the space um, events uh, alive. So, um, 
So what we call the F bar is the average in space. And so the natural splitting is in the, in the homogenized portion and the very small amplitude or ne small negligible amplitude for the uh, variations in space. And that, that particular uh, average in space, the F bar actually splits into a Maxwellian distribution. Doesn't have to be Maxwellian. I mean, we call it, it can be any distribution that decays sufficiently fast. And, and we believe any, any, any distribution that decays with, that decays with at, least, uh, at least energy embedded, it should be fine. But maybe you want to be more cautious and put maybe three, four moments about it. Um, so, so the 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 and in that in the same setting, then the electric field then is split in the average pass part plus a small perturbation that um, that is going to be the um, the uh, the spectral part, but the whole uh, uh, variation that appears then and taking the Maxwell's uh, sorry the Fourier transform it will actually give rise to this function W, that this is what we call the spectral energy density function, which is exactly modeled by this form and it becomes an order of epsilon. So it's perturbing what comes up from the space. So it's like you have, you know, the average in space, it takes a, also a good average of the field, but because you have a perturbation, that perturbation lives in a spectral moment, in, in a spectral space. And that is enough to get something that if you start even with a, with a Maxwell distribution here and a perturbation that original is going to be even a, Max, a Maxwell form, you will not observe Landau damping. On the contrary, you get to see that something is, is arising that cannot have a, 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 a kind of, um, uh, it, it, that it goes back to the to the to or, or it makes to dissipate completely this f and go back to the to the original uh, distribution. So so having said that, let me tell you how this uh, comes to be. And I and I show you first the the the, the model. Then I, I might say something more about how to explain it or 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 to calculate this derivation. But in the quasi-linear system that arises then is an equation for the probability distribution function where you see the delta F is gone. And what we are perturbing in this analysis or, or this simulation, uh, better say, because we don't have the analysis for the whole field, for the whole um, magnetized, highly magnetized problem, but we do have it for the electrostatic and it would be in this framework. So we really focus on the perturbation. And, uh, and and what we have is that that perturbation becomes um, a dissipative mechanism, mechanism with the caveat that dissipation is due for, uh, so it's, a, it, it's actually a divergence form. It's almost like a Landau structure on, on, on how you do the calculations of the, or even the Leonard Valescu approach. But that dissipation uh, coefficient or diffusion coefficient, if you wish, actually is dependent on the energy uh, of the cell, which is the spectral, uh, the density, uh, sorry, the spectral um, energy density set. Okay. Uh, by the way, this is also called in the literature of physics, the plasma. I found it kind of a funny word that makes no much sense to, fact, to the fact that the plasma is, you have the particles moving around and the plasma, what it's doing is kicking up with these frequencies, what the particles might be moving. It's like, like particles moving in a sea that may be kicked by this, um, this uh, energy, spectral energy that is inherited by the Maxwell's equations so of the perturbation that came up on after the, the God exilon. So uh, the model consists then in a particle distribution function F of P satisfying diffusion equation whose diffusion coefficient depend on the spectral density uh, W. Oh, I'm sorry. I want to keep on, I should not move this so fast. So the spectral wave energy perturbation factor actually that appears here, and you see this is simply an ordinary differential equation for W with a perturbation. Otherwise, it would be a trivial equation, right? And it would you, you would actually get back into the Hamiltonian dynamics that that's what we are doing with Gunnett as our next project and Chiwenshu. 
but um, but 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 here what you get to see is that, and this is key, that what happens is this perturbation term, right, which is what we call the perturbation factor for the for the plasma or the set equation or the set uh, variable. Um, in cylindrical coordinates is represented in this form. And this is actually a very beautiful uh, representation. And, and if you look at this, here is a mixing function that actually thrives on a resonance condition and you have it to see it here. So please read it here. Actually, the physicists want to end, add a lot of uh, frequencies where um, the resonance condition that we want to put which is where this SL being equals to zero, right? Or, or, or what we call the dispersion relation, some people like to call this, is that uh, the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the frequency that is going to be calculated, right? Due to the, uh, it's calculated from the bulk, from the dielectric constant that comes from the, from the uh, bulk, um, massive uh, PDF is not, this is not in the lecture, but it is in the, in the paper, um, in the in the papers we are writing, and 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 in the in the in previous lectures that I have, have done, and, and we are actually doing an extenuating uh, analysis of how to get the things in a general domain. But 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 what comes up here is very interesting. Here is to take several um, copies, as many as you want, of this sum on 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 L, if you wish. Uh, the, the 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 simulations for highly magnetized at least they get they want one w is the cyclotonic frequency gamma of p is the relativistic factor you have to work in relativistic domain and that is not a problem at all for the simulations and uh, and this is the classical somehow dispersion relation that would come extended from the one d which says that momentum. And, and, and K space, momentum and spectral space in the dispersion relation in the absence of this L equals to zero becomes a one directional uh, object because here this dot product would actually put a, a one dimensional uh, uh, factor that corresponds to a relativized uh, momentum. Uh, but that will come up later on. So, so I just want to give you a little bit of the of the historical model mo um, um, remarks of the model. I, I would leave it, but there is a very nice work of Nicholson, which actually uh, uh, ends on is the really is the electrostatic case of perturbations for blasts of Poisson, and um, and uh, which means it's basically in one D, and 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 it goes at the end with the derivation of Valescu in higher dimensions. And um, so the transition rates of the particle distribution are correlated with um, Fourier transform of the Poisson equation, very much like we do it in, in, in like the Landau did, and we do it in, 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 in uh, spectral analysis for, for the uh, transport equations. Uh, in general, the, the, the breaking of symmetry is arising of positive Young values. This is something we calculate, not in this lecture, but the dispersion relation actually is related to this expression in 1D, where the velocity in the rel relativized um, um, uh, medium is, is of this form, and, and gamma P is the relativistic factor. So in the 1D case, this becomes that B of P is simply this. If not, it's, it's, it's a much more sophisticated form. And here you would have to do this dispersion relations with the full K and the full B. Uh, so, now. Um, so the recent regular work on how to do it in the 1D, I recommend you go to and, and produce the work of Pardo Sanders in 21, because they are really behind uh, the derivation of this rigorous model that was proposed by Ivanov and Buda. And, and it's on the tools of all the people that I mentioned. So, so, um, so let me just say a few things. In the vast of system, the gyro average scaling arguments and their Gothic theorem expand on the first perturbation that incorporates with a cyclotronic frequency. And I would like to, to, to check that the mathematics of this statement was fully developed by Mihai Bostan in, in 09 and, and 2009 and 2010. So that was actually very interesting for me because I was somehow unaware of that. And it was Kuhn that came 
uh, you know, because I said, we find we need to find the justification of that. And he came and says, oh, was a collaborator of you two years later. And indeed, we did something for magnetized plasma with plasma plasma. But yeah, that's, um, that's an interesting remark. Um, formally, if you want to see how the model is, I, I insist, go to Thorn 17, in which they postulate uh, the models for um, suitable for strongly magnetized plasma and tokamak, so radiating uh, systems and their random phase approximation ergodic theorems result in a KT space homogeneous system given by this exactly uh, explanation that I gave you in the previous uh, slide. This is quasi linear diffusion of magnetized plasma with velocity V of P by, um, by uh, the probability distribution function PJ. From it occurs from a stimulated emissions and absorption waves for plasmons of, of the spectral energy waves via the wave particle resonance from Lorentzian forces and Poisson, such as Poisson and Maxwell's uh, equation. So that actually um, gets um, a very interesting way to fully understand how to write properly the 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 what the dispersion relation because it's is crucial. It's crucial that, and here is the where the fit, random phase approximation um, allow us to put in the in the um, in the in the average in space the cyclotronic frequency to do a sort of absorption term into the resonant position. Okay, so um, getting details is what is this function VPK that you saw in the perturbation. And let me just say, this is very important because it is going to be, I, I, I view it to the analog, to the analog we have in kinetic theory to model transition probabilities when you put particle interactions. And, um, and, and after, you know, the beginning, it all, all looked very esoteric, but one day I realized, no, this is about the same thing because the way it enters into the distribution function into the, the momentum equation, uh, for the distribution function in momenta, that is um, uh, that is in the non-relativistic unmagnetized or electrostatic plasma, a very simple um, a very simple localization of the dispersion relation, and um, and but in the magnetized, it may have all of these extra terms that absorb and emit um, the relativization of the plasma because this new one has the the way to to contribute so the sl here as you see contributes with the relativization and the cyclotronic frequency at any order you want to go these are integer numbers these are like uh, getting into the counting of uh, of the gaps in between the hopping of electrons that is a little bit out of the scope of what I, I've been looking up into details now and and I don't know how to reduce this into something that's saying takes L equals to one and that I call it absorption pretty much like the Paoli the, the golden Fermi rule does for the equation. So here is a, it's a, just a plasma wave uh, theory, the derivation why we eliminated uh, from the perturbation equation and the W equation, these terms as you start to look into the divergence form. And it turns out that when you are in a very um, peak regime for M, so this is a rendering of the Book of Thorn. What you should expect is that here you have, oh, sorry, here you would have something a very cold, almost cold, very cold plasma. That it would be something very picked, and then back in here you have a, a tail. And under those in simulation, those configurations, this is assumed that it's going to be basically being of order um, of order zero, and then uh, they are eliminated. And that we take it from the explanation of four. So here is the electron resonance with very deep. With very small uh, momenta, do not resonate with waves. Okay, so so uh, what you get then is this uh, system, which now I can uh, integrate more in the mathematical frame, and I really like this part. <laughs> so what we basically have is two cases, and I'm going to be coded by colors. I put blue the non-relativistic and highly magnetized; they come on red, and these are the forms of 
the um what I would like to say, the directional differential operator that we get, because it's very important in the conformation of the um of the uh, interaction uh integrals when you look at these equations. So so uh the beta is nothing else than the gradient of pk written in terms of the cylindrical coordinates in the framework we are working. So for the for the uh, relativistic and magnetized plasma, the electrostatic case is very simple. It's, it's the renormalization of k, the, the unit by, uh, unitary vector k. But in, in 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 higher dimensions, in two or three dimensions, we did the simulations in three with um, with um, uh, cylindrical coordinates. As I said, you need to go into this framework, and that actually remarkably changed the output of the simulation. Um, so the equations then become the momentum equation is actually going to be, and look what we said here is if we take the classical definition of the adjoint operator, right, and with respect to this operator L, and you see that L is a vector which is uh, dot to uh, the gradient of a given function P, then what we have here is that this equation can be written as the uh, integral of the adjoint operator of the of this b of this l operator acting on this form. So it's actually really quite interesting because this is going to be then acting on. So so the way you would define it is exactly in this way when we put it in a in a weak form. Similarly, you can do on this uh, equation, which in fact you don't take the adjoint. So all of a sudden you realize that what is going on here? All right, what is going on here is the following. Remember that for P, the equation for P, what happens here, F depends on P. I should have actually put the dependence on P here. It's P and T, right? The W equation depends on K and B depends on P and K, but it has a dispersion relation through the Dirac delta function, which is actually, you know, um, uh, calculated here, right? Is when you take these terms here. Sorry, let me just go back into this form that I have them here, exactly in this experiment. Okay, so this is what the BPK is. So this is a bunch. It's a collection of dispersion relations, and in the case L is one, and you are in one dimension. This actually collapses in K uh, times P in K uh, unitary vector K times P. So, so, um, so in that sense, right, what really matters is to understand how to calculate this gamma beta acting on any operator when you put it here in the weak formulation, because that's what we are going to be doing for, for the simulations as well, is by a digit. And we can actually prove with these formulas the conservation of mass, uh, the momentum for the parallel component and the um, and the and the energy as much as the entropy of the total system. So you can actually prove that it can be done. So so um, so this operator, if you wish. So what I said, what I want to say is that this BPK, when you perform the integral in K, exercise the dispersion relation, and so this term becomes more local as a PDE into the um, P space. Similarly, when you do this effect, because F depends on P, but actually the local energy here, P, is, is coming from this relativiz relativization or in the case of, um, of, um, of, um, of uh, 1D is, 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 is proportional to, to the, the classical momentum in 1D. When you do perform the calculation in P, it gives a coefficient that ends up depending on k, and that is the integral that you get to see for this particular form. So it's the integration with respect to p that arises a term on k. And so, so, so with that, we can start really uh, looking at the weak form. And the weak form comes very naturally, um, uh, you know, operating with the fact that this L operator is a directional uh, differentiation over a gradient term. 
And when you have that, that means you can always do this uh, um, integration by parts, by weak forms. And so the weak formulation of the, so I, by now you realize that I'm, the momentum equation is only going to come tinted in, in this um, kind of burnt or diluted or uh, kind of orange, and this is a diluted green. But you said the orange, you know, and, and please, call, these are color coded. So you need to solve them as a system because you get to see that both of them actually fit into each other. And, um, and the definition actually here, you get to see how they are, both of them going to be integrated, right? Into, this is something that we like to call the super weak uh, form or the ultra weak form, some people refer to that. And that actually comes. And then, uh, and then uh, we realize uh, actually after doing the numeric that this, all this structure was actually very useful. So the system then becomes, and in a weak form, testing phi, the, the, the momentum and eta, the, the, the spectral uh, density um, equation, uh, then becomes uh, weak forms of this, uh, of this. So the right-hand side at this time. You may call this, um, I, I don't know to call a Boltzmann equation, but it reminds the Landau structure that arises when you do this kind of grazing limits, when you take some answer, some things into, you know, you may view it as a small perturbation of, of this space uh, deviations. And, um, and, um, and the interesting point is that also this structure enables us to get immediately the things that we want because we can test with uh, the momentum with one and look at, at mass and the set energy zero because there is no uh, no perturbation of the mass. It's a divergence of form equation. And so that would be the correct testing. And that would give you that the first, um, the first, uh, uh, this would be zero because it's a divergence form equation. This actually is zero because you're testing with zero. And so it coincides with the definition of the L star structure that you got for the, for the um, uh, conform with conformation associated to the momentum equation um, or the transport equation. Um, for the spectral density, right, we, we actually, <coughs> Uh, take a, a slightly different um, uh, uh, transformation related to Planck constant and the dispersion relation in, in, in K. And then uh, N of K is the number of occupation. And then you can say that the number of occupation actually is proportional to these numbers. And that actually are going to be important for the calculations later on. I'll bring it later on. But, but, uh, but what we have here is that the total... Um, momentum uh, is going to be conserved in this framework using also the manipulation of the L operator now acting on the blue form, right? I mean, remember that, sorry, I, I should have put it in green, it's, it's in, this, in this form. Okay, so that should have been green. But in any case, then you get the components of the momentum that are suitable in that direction going to be. The momentum component perpendicular to the magnetic field has to be zero. And that actually you can prove it. And that comes because of the cylindrical symmetry. And again, the manipulation that you do on the beta operator, which is the, the directional derivative, I mean, through the form of L, it gives you an exact calculation in this case for 1D or higher dimensions. And I let you calculate. This is, we, we have all of this in the, in the paper uh, that is in, in turn of computational physics and with all details. And that, that's already published. And so, and so um, the, then we have that the, the total energy, what you do is test with the energy being the 1D or the energy in higher dimensions, which is this relativized form. Again, is the structure of the, of the L operator and, and the diffusion and, and the form it appears this, the, ODE for the set equation, where the operator only acts on the energy, gives you exactly what, what you have. And so the, the sum, so you test the, 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 the spectral density with one and the, and the momentum, uh, the, uh, uh, the momentum space 
distribution function with the local energy, local energy coming from the dispersion relation, and they give you that that has to be C. And that calculation is, is it takes about a page, it's not a big deal, and it's in publishing the work we have with that, with um, Kuhn, Abdel Malik, and, 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 um, and, uh, and Weissman. And it's also, we can show that the, uh, that the local uh, form the local that the, the the entropy because it's the only one that can actually have an entropy as far as we could get or we could get this we would not get it if you put the, the w we didn't know even what to put for w as entropy but there is an entropy for the particle distribution function that is very interesting and decays and this is the plot on the entropy uh, none of this has been re rigorous except these derivations of loss but we don't know the, set, the notion of solution for higher dimensions yet. Uh, the H theorem calculation, I'm going to skip this, but I said it was there in detail, but also you can look at it later on from here. And, and the use of the cylindrical coordinates is crucial. This is something that for me is, uh, is a, it was an eye-opening. We, we, we do kinetic theory mostly on, on a Cartesian coordinates and may not be the most friendly way to do things, uh, even like the and that question, but that is discussion for another time. So, so okay, so the, the, the uh, so this, and, and here comes something very interesting. Even if there is, given that this is an entropy, then there exists an infinite state. We are going to call it the Maxwellian of the perturbation. That's the B that I put at the beginning. That cannot be a Maxwell distribution function in fluid space. And the reason is that the that the that the applying the entropy to that would give you zero. And that is not what we expect, because in fact, you can show from the even in the 1D, even looking at the slides and so on, that there exists a distribution function, I mean, at least a numerical. Uh, doing not in the in the one D case you can show it's part of the of the proof that there exists a, a probability distribution function at infinite on which uh, and and a, and a spectral energy density that they satisfied this uh, relation on the um, on the uh, on the on the sort of collision operator or or the right hand side or the quasi linear diffusion part of the momentum for which this is zero. So it's very interesting. It's, it, it decays to equilibrium, but it's the set that actually push it out of being a Gaussian. So this is a beautiful example or where you have entropy, which can give you a lot of estimates to many things. But the interesting point is that I don't think you can use the relative entropy in the classical way, unless you use it with this form, which we don't know what it is, but we compute it. So I, I'm, I'm I, will, I wish I could say more about this, but but I don't. Well, we actually look, and, and here I'm, I'm just a splinter, you know, spicing or, or sprinkling some ideas that came from the numerical method. We got that the, the stability in L2, and that actually comes very handy to, uh, to get things that we eventually end up doing error estimates. But for that, I need to understand the analysis of the space. And, and that is what I want to get as soon as possible. So, so, um, so the proof, I'm going to skip it, but you can read. So in the one dimen di dimensional model, again, is, is not Rostokov, it's, it's, even, I didn't know, it's Rudakov, and I forgot to do this. Um, so the 1D model becomes much simpler. And this is what I want to show you where the mathematics is. I'm not sure how, how much time I, I'm, I'm having, but um, but um, but I guess I'll I'll try to do a little bit uh, of this and explain it. As for the numerics, um, as for the numerics, I we use a, a DG scheme. In this particular case, we did it conformal. Um, uh, we believe we should not do it. We are extending it now to a better set of basis functions that also may arise uh, with a better notion of uh, conservation, but this is work in progress and I cannot say much. 
but um, the boundary conditions in the computational domains really matter. And this is crucial because the first paper we did, even in 1D, we did in a, in a, in a fixed domain on which we secure that the initial data is in a well cut off domain where it's zero on the on the both sides and it's need to always be supported away from the origin. Why is that? This this F that we are modeling is the perturbation of the massive uh, distribution that may be very cold, but is a bump on tail. So you would not put the bump on tail on the origin, or for which P is very small. So the bump on tail is far away from the origin. So from that point of view, we actually, and I will explain exactly what we mean by that when I do the analysis in 1D. But what happens here is that we need to have some assumptions on which this actually is going to happen. So our uh, distribution function and the directional derivatives have to be zero at the end points. And this is what we get in the simulation. It's exactly like when you simulate Boltzmann equations that are in a confine and you know that they are going to converge to equilibrium, you know they are not going to Miranda into the space. Remember that there are steady states here, right? But we do not know where they are. So you take a very safe, large cutoff domain gap the omega sub p, and they should work. And then we look at the weak formulation and solve uh, uh, a stagger scheme. So this is the, 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 the weak form and the, the um, and we applied what is called for the Dirichlet boundary conditions, the niche, the niche method, and ends up being um, a simulation on which is like a domain decomposition type of thing on which you actually compute, it's like a way also to compute the system. So you are staggering from the initial data, you calculate uh, what is F1 from here, you, so you calculate the diffusion, and then you calculate the, the momentum, the quasi-linear diffusion from here, you calculate the, the perturbation, right? You start from, from F0, calculate the perturbation, and then you solve the ODE, and that gives you the one, and then you iterate, iterate, iterate. And it actually, in, in, even in one of the first two, three trials, it worked. Uh, the simulation of this, I give lots of credit to my student Kuhn that he actually uh, study. Um, and I asked him, I mean, get into the literature, how do you do these calculations? And he came up, came up with this marcher simple algorithms, they will say, and Humel, now would maybe we can do something even better, but that's too much to, to say too soon. But that enabled us to do a very interesting calculation on which you can put the dispersion relation on any function, all right? And the function needs to be integral. That's basically what you get. And the fully discrete system gives you, uh, you get to be that is stable, uh, the spectral density comes up to be positive because it is an exponential form. This actually, for as long as this doesn't go to infinite and that is an, something of interest to talk about it and when I do. And here are the simulations of the 1D case. This is actually the, somehow rendering this, this is much more exact. We start with the blue line here. Here are the, the, the momentum is localized at 10 units and plasma frequencies. And then uh, you see that from this side, it's like the Penrose condition happened. So whatever happened on the, this size is like Dandau dumping and it's pushing it back and keep it stable. But this side, the, the, the you get an instability because this is growing and it has a space to move on because the massive distribution, let me show it in the next one, is about here. So it, there is a lot of space for the instability to move on. And so when it moves on, and the reason this is happening on high energy momenta, because the perturbation is very far away on the tail, all right? I mean, or far away on the tail. And I tell you how far it has to be to be with them. And so essentially what you get to see, and this is telling, um, you start with the Maxwellian distribution. This Maxwellian distribution, which is a perturbation, starts to spread, right? The first spread we plot is in orange and comes here. Looks like I would say here that um, there is a contact discontinuity 
And then uh, here may be another contact discontinuity here maybe. And then you get to the point on which the, the, the dispersion relation doesn't let you to move any longer because the dispersion relation, the do omega that comes in the dispersion relation, but, but as I said, the, the frequency, the dielectric frequency coming from this massive distribution basically decays so fast that kills it. And it looks like this is a jump discontinuity if I plot it independently. Right here, we would have to much, go much more and get into something that it gets much closer. Here is CO4. So this simulation didn't get into this time. So, the, so this simulation stops at about here, at about the zero six. It's about this. Okay. So, so, so W remains positive for all times. B, we don't know. We can actually calculate the effect that indeed the system, the total. Um, the total energy is conserved, the total momentum is conserved, you get the decay of uh, energy. And then here we did a simulation, sorry about this, uh, this parenthesis here should be up, but this is that, that this is what we use in the highly magnetized uh, in the 2D, 3D with the spectral energy. And then we, we actually show the, um, the electron and, and so the solid, uh, here are the um, the ones that are ex so the dash lines are explicit, and the and the, the the one that these are the ones that you should calculate uh, using the um, the simulation. The solid are the ones that come from uh, using this kind of um, pre. Uh, this is uh, what they call this, um, yeah, the the, uh, it's, it's the the cyclotronic frequency for a whistle wave. Okay, so so what is interesting that you pick up actually some differences, maybe not so significant even the momentum, but in the energy you get to see it more. So 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 this is the exact and the approximation. So the the exact is the the uh, the x and the approximation is the, the, the sudden. Okay, so this is the plot of the L operator when you see, and then you get to see in two D. I mean, this is projected into D. Here, I'm actually doing the component of the um, corresponding to the p parallel renormalized by the momentum and the relativistic uh, form. And that basically shows, and this is the calculation of what is the PDFF. And if you see what is happening, this, this simulation that you see in 1D, that was a Gaussian that comes into this direction. Now it comes into that direction, which is exactly mimetizing something at about 20. It would be go, moving along this line here. Okay, I don't want to, it's moving along this line. And the spread, Right, you can see that there is more spread into this direction, but I interpret this spread like the radial spread in one D. So, what is radial in one D is the parallel direction in the in the magnetized um, uh, problem. Okay, that that's basically what we always do with it. And we started with a perturbation, as I said here, of the um, of the PDF. And, and here, what you get to see is the spectral density wave. And this is at different times. This is a shorter time. So here we put zero at shorter times. It starts to be a little bit perturbed all over, and but, but a very negligible. The zero is at green. And then, uh, and then, is, um, and then you get to see the peaks that appear here in the in the which corresponds to high energy events because of this magnetization and, and this is growing as much as this is spread. So this is the calculation of the system. Um, by the way, there is some work of Brennan and collaborators in the group of uh, Princeton Plasma Labs and from also from Oak Ridge and and um, and, and from Los Alamos that uh, they acknowledge that this actually is what has been seen. Some people have been putting only one first step, but, but it's not 
but this is a complete simulation. So let me then, uh, the existence of solutions, I, can I take 10 minutes or is this out of question? I'm not sure what time is it now. So um, yes, but uh, there won't be, will be less time for questions yeah. because All right. we can only stay about another 10, at most 15 minutes past oh, no, the okay. hour. No, no, no. Okay. It's 26. So I, yeah, probably in eight minutes, I should be able to do it. So I want to show you how this comes to be in the 1D case. All right. So at this point, I'm writing in the 1D equation, the energy, remember, is this object. So this would be, so what is B acting on, on the gradient of F is actually this operator. You see, is this operator here. This is the beta operator in K and P, okay? Acting on F. So that would give me the L star of, um, of the, sorry, I have to also put the W. So, so if I take the, um, uh, the B operator, it would be this, this term. Uh, similarly, the same thing happened here. So you would have to, to we go back and, and we can trace it, but here we, it's easier to work it out as it is. So in the one dimensional form, you can actually write these equations and without loss of generalization in this part, but then later on, I put a lambda here and you will see one minus lambda here in a, or a function of one minus lambda, that because that is the omega I had before. When I write it here, I, uh, this is an abuse of notation, that one may be a factor that depends on how much you have deviated originally your, your body. And so the, the system seems to be very simple and it's indeed very simple to simulate. Um, so from the, um, in the electrostatic setting, then you can actually write it in this form where, and here is where it comes, the dispersion relation, I'm not going to take it to be one. I'm going to be taking more into the physics framework. This is what we decided with Kuhn after we finished this first problem in, in bounded domains. Uh, you can act, you must use the, the von Gross dispersion relation that comes from warm plasmas because the effect that you have this perturbation on a tail is that it's warm, that is heating the system. This is what you get to see the high energy uh, being produced by the spectral energy density effect of the Lorentzian force. So, so the perturbation is doing that of the tail. And so, and so what happened is that you, you, you do have that the dispersion relation is going to be proportional to the divide length which actually depends on the variance of the probability distribution function, which we assume that is going to be a, a constant temperature. You, you may make it depend on F, that would be more like complex for the equation. So let me assume that this is the average of the variance in within the event of your simulation. So, so in that case, uh, we are going to just nickname lambda to be the divide length, and this is the plasma constant that you we, it appears uh, renormalized by the speed of sound that appears in all physics books, and that is the dispersion relation that comes up. It's one minus lambda square proportional to k square. So omega, this is the omega that we thought it was a function of k, and it's quadratic in k or the square root in. In fact, it's the it could be actually linear in k if you have this lack of lamb, if you don't put the one and take lamb equals to one. That is what people was doing. This is what we actually get for free because it, it the analysis doesn't care about if what happens here, even it depends on that. And so essentially what we have is uh, we can plot the resonant condition and the resonant condition can be written in P explicitly as much as in K. And that is great because when you do the integrations, of the equations in weak forms, you can invoke the formula for P or for K, depending if you integrate with respect to, to, to P or with, with respect to K or with respect to P, or the other way around. So we also introduced the following auxiliary function. We are going to use a P, and this has a long story I don't have to tell, but it's originally related to some writings of Ivanov and, and, and Rudakov. Um, we are going to, for symmetry and simplicity, we get that this is going to be at the end a positive solution in this domain, but I'll use it as an auxiliary, to, auxiliary function 
on which uh, you look from minus infinite to this minus lambda value and to infinite to lambda value. So that is great because when you get the values of P, right? To So so you would not, that, that basically tells you would not model these equations in within minus lambda lambda because these are the void spaces on which you would cool too much the bump on them. Right, I mean, let me just uh, put it that way. So, so, so then we get uh, the system written into these two equations becomes this form and this form. Uh, U of PT can be actually written as a function of the spectral density function in P, depending on T. And that would come through the form of the dispersion relation. And this is what we have for the resonance condition, basically. That's what we see, the rest. So, so that is very interesting because you can see that this term here, this full term here, is exactly what appears in the, the parentheses when you write it that way, right? And that means that we are going to have an, a relation between the time derivative of f with respect to the p derivative of u sub, of u sub t because and differentiate u differentiate with respect to p, sorry, f differentiate with respect to p, whatever is in this right-hand side, okay? And so, and so it gives us an uh, almost, it's a first order equation, but it's an algebraic equation, which it says, if we can find a problem for u and I can solve this equation, I can solve the system because I can solve f. So in a nutshell, I, I'm running out of time. I'm going to write a statement for you. I won't be able to go through the proof, uh, but the proof that I showed here is what we posted on our cave in the first version, what happened in the deal. We are finishing as we speak and will be posted in a couple of weeks, the, the full proof here. Okay, so what we have here is the, uh, the P equation. If you look, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a non-divergence equation which has a very, you know, a, a, a non-local term, which is the generate because it has a P, right? It's a, it's a gamma of P here. I, I use gamma, unfortunately, it's, it's now gamma. It's not the relativistic factor. It's this, I should change that letter. And then here is um, in a very non, um, it's not a divergent form, but we didn't know what to do with this. And we said, let's try divergence form and everything was fine, except that we have here, uh, gradient square term that we couldn't find anywhere. Neither we knew much how to deal with a problem that we have here, um, a degeneracy. So uh, the statement of the theorem is the following. Uh, if I take an initial data, which has these conditions and take, this is going to be just the, the positive part of the domain is my cut of domain, which is the one I use for the simulation. The heat cap associated to that domain, and then I actually take initial data that has to be well prepared, if you wish, because it has to know about the relations with respect to this um, um, resonance condition that for we could tell lambda that depends of the divide length and the and these uh, physical uh, conditions, and and also needs to know the gamma factor here and here. Then, uh, if if you have a solution U in L two such that for any pair, right, that of, um, sorry, for any eta in the testing space, we have that I get this, the solution of this problem. So I assume they have the solution and I don't have a proof of this statement here. I don't mention it, but we do solve it. It's a theorem two in our manuscript. Then you have that, um, if you define f of p, and look what we do here, we use the fact that one operator was the um, the 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 adjoint of the other. You remember there was here we had the adjoint operator l, here we have the l. So we look at these two terms as the adjoint spaces that we need to have associated the resolution of this problem. Then we can recover. <coughs> Sorry. We can uh, put the initial data here for P, the initial data in this domain for K, and it has to be zero otherwise in the supplement of that domain. 
then we do have, and, and I, I repeated this so you can read this thing in, in entire. Then if there exists a positive constant for which the soup, the, the, the soup, I mean the the in a sense the the uh the I, bound Irene, may, yeah. may I stop you. Yeah. Yes, I you think have we already stop. ran out of time. Okay. All right. So just let me say that and under these conditions, you can actually get um, a weak formulation, a weak form for which uh, the solution exists. And it tells us that W is in W12 and, and F is in going to be, and the best thing we get is in L2. And I just want to say, I wish I could have L infinite here because this is what I observe. I want to remove that singularity of L2 we still don't know how to do that. We are attempting the Georgie, but we are attempting other kind of things. Uh, the Georgie technique may uh, work. And on this, I stop. Um, and I, uh, you have here some conclusions and some tools of the proof of the, for the previous case. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for very interesting and also very uh actually passionate this lecture okay so now maybe we as you have expanded maybe a little bit minutes for questions and uh, if you have any question you can unmute yourself in the okay. audience and also you can write your question in the chat we can start so maybe just a start maybe just as uh, maybe small question is uh, uh so from my understanding actually this philosophical classroom system has a land of damping. I mean, for now, you, you put actually this magnetized, uh, you can you start from the Vilasov max way. So it looks like actually you lose the land of damping. Is it the case or, or? That's right. And that's exactly the point. Land of damping actually requires, it has a lot of uh, um, answers to happen. You don't do it for an arbitrary data. It has to be a very small bump on tail and it has to be sort of closer to the tail. Did you see what happens here is here you have a cold plasma, but there is a small perturbation back on the tail. In the Landau damping case, they, if they are going to do that, it has to be extenuatingly small and they choose it to be sufficiently small to cut Landau damping. This is post Landau damping. This is very well explained by Bardos and Bess. That's, that's what I, it, what happens is, is, is in this picture that I that I show you here. I'm not sure how to do this quickly. This this picture, all right. So so look at what we put here is you put the the bump on tail. So here we don't plot it because this MP is huge, and it's actually you know here we are taking one fifth of this distance. The, the effect on which this is, is, is even valid, that perturbation is that this should be smaller. So the, the variance of MP should be smaller. So, but we start with some bump on tail and this is enough to push this back to, so this side, like I see in this arrow, it goes back because here you have the Penrose condition. Here, the derivative of F is decaying, but here is growing. But there is not basically no particles here of this uh, of this level. Some perturbation happen at high energies that you mm -hmm. kick with high energy and in, in high momentum. And that so this is the initial data. That's exactly the point. And it has to do with the fact that I said the initial data has to also have this condition. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it, it that's what I say it has to be a well prepared problem. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you don't see it. I'm, I'm not finding it now. Where was yeah. it? This is, this is really interesting, as you, at least yeah. mathematically. We need to work on this to figure out, I mean, how actually, at least at the level of formula. So, actually, uh, yeah. yeah. But yeah. this is it's only, you know, the part. analysis The analysis for blast of Poisson. That's what I want to say. The numerics mm -hmm. is for blast of matter. And I think okay. they are, we are getting cues from Blas of Poisson that may tell us how to prove, but the leap of 1D to 2D is enormous because the, the directional 
so the operator L, this direction operator L acting on gradients, where the gradient is really cylindrical coordinates, but the, the, the resonance condition only goes in one direction of the parallel the di the direction of the, of the magnetic field, that we still do not have. Um, I think, you know, I know I saw earlier today that Stephen Pankavich is in the, in the in, if, if you are still around, uh, he may know how to handle this high order uh, magnetized uh, 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 dimensions. I would love to talk to you, Stephen, if you are there. <laughs> I don't know if I have a good answer. <laughs> Thank you, Irene, for mentioning me. I don't know if no. I have an answer to the question, um, but no. maybe something we could talk about later. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think uh, uh, due to the time, maybe uh, uh, we should close today's uh, Actually, it is a question part, and I, I, we, we like to thank uh, uh, the speaker, Professor Irene uh, Gamper, once again. Thank you very much.